The big question in life is what happens after we die? And there are thousands upon thousands of organizations throughout the world that claim to know scientists are trying to figure this out. A lot of people will tell you what happens, but I guess unless you really experience it for yourself, you don't know for sure. And it's obviously something we all hope for. But it's now so serious because the National Institute of Health have reported that an estimated 9 million people, 9 million people have had some type of near death experience. 17% of the people, according to the report on their website, have been clinically dead when they claim to have left their body. And these people now have their own personal experience vindicating that they know life goes on. Many of these people, what I find fascinating, are atheists, people that did not believe in God, that then have this new faith and belief, and many of them claim to have seen God. It's happened to people of all walks of life from all over the world, children, adults, scientists, physicians, priests, ministers, so nobody is a uh, void when they have these near-death experiences based on their former beliefs. And it's gotten to the point now where the government has taken it so serious that in 1998, there was an organization formed called the Near-Death Experience Research Foundation. And this was established to conduct near-death experience research and to be a public service because when you have a rising number of people who have had these near-death experiences, they need to have, provide information, education to help people understand what is happening to them. And of course, in the science, they're trying to connect it to the brain, what is happening in the brain. But it's such a reality for people that have had these experiences that I wanted to have a guest on to tell his story. Now, there are so many people I could reach out to, but I wanted to speak to Lilia. Lilia works for Reverend Lee Whitting, who is a very popular host of the Near Death Experience radio show. This is a podcast that only tells the stories. People are telling their stories of dying, leaving their body. Many see God, many claim it's Jesus. And so Lily's job is to really pre-interview people to really weed them out, to see if they're credible enough to go on this uh, podcast that Lee Whitting does. And I was a guest. I didn't have this major uh, dramatic event, but they wanted me to go on and I shared my story. So she sent to me Brian Hoyland. This is an army veteran who is a psychotherapist. There is some legitimacy to who this person is. This conversation is it's really fascinating. He got sick, he died, he left his body, and he saw God. So I had a lot of questions, and I think these are questions that you would ask as well. So without further ado, let's have uh, this incredibly encouraging and inspiring, uh, controversial conversation with former Army veteran psychotherapist Brian Hoyland. Cause you took my scars, bruises and broken heart And numbed all the pain, show me how to heal And now I don't feel broken anymore Number one, Billboard pianist Paul Cardall do you believe in miracles and second chances? Over a decade ago, I was raised from the dead. Read Paul's story, The Broken Miracle, by J.D. Netto. Visit thebrokenmiracle.com. All right, my guest is Brian Hoyland, who has had a heart transplant. And so between us, uh, this is going to be a very heart-to-heart -heart conversation. And uh, God did say, change your heart. So here are two of... Those people who love God that have taken that completely literally, would you say, Brian? Yeah, whether we had a choice or not, but I think it's a 
it's a good thing, isn't it? Oh, I think it's a fantastic thing. I don't think any of us really choose our situations. It's almost like there's a customized curriculum that God has for each one of us, right? Yeah, and it makes life so much easier if you follow along with it. Just <laughs> opens up so many doors. Why do you think we rebel from it? What is it in us to want to wanna just goof off and, and, and be? Yeah, like you know, with me, I can, only, I can only speak for myself. I'm just obstinate. It just comes down to, you know, I like to do things my own way and I'm stubborn and I've been that way since I was a kid. And, but, you know, it's, I've, I've found that he's so much, you know, he's wiser than I am, but he's so much gentler and kinder than I am too. I'm, I'm way harder on myself than God ever has been. His, his corrections have always been for my, my good. Yeah. He's always filled the best for me. It's always hard to understand or comprehend that. And it's almost like we have to have these experiences to get, uh, I guess, our senses realigned, you know, to get yeah. knocked out, basically, to get back up again, to know what it's all about. And, you know, we're going to get into your story. You know, you you were in the army. Um, you got sick. You uh, uh, went through this heart transplant. You actually had a near-death experience where you you went to heaven, and you saw God and saw a lot of things. And so we're going to get into that. But I want to go back to the the childhood and the upbringing because a lot of people that have these near-death experience have interesting childhoods. And did you did you come from a religious home? I see a lot of uh, Catholic. Um, um, I'm I'm married into a Catholic family, so I I understand and see so much of what is familiar to me. Yeah, no, you know, growing up, I wasn't Catholic. I I didn't convert to being Catholic until I was 27. Hmm. Um, but growing up, I you know, my, I came from a religious home, but it was non denominational. Um, you know, so I, I did have a, a grandfather who was Assembly of God minister, and wow. he, he really did not care for the Catholics. So it was kind of a strange deal to to go this direction later in life. But you know, I guess to each his own. Um, but you know, I, I, I to really answer your question, you know, growing up, I did have a, a a family that that believed that we weren't we weren't our own creators. That you know, we didn't we didn't just happen to materialize here on Earth and. So that's where I came from that. Your parents, what's their heritage? Um, well, they're German and English and, you know, kind of a mutt of all European things, I guess. Yeah, that's, I guess that's kind of like uh, me as well. A lot of British, a lot of Dutch. But Minnesota, is a, uh, there's a lot of immigrants from uh, Europe. And so that's why I'm asking if you had yeah. any specific, you know, I figured German since... Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, we've got we've got that whole British Isles, we have Ireland, and then I guess a little bit of Nor Norwegian heritage. Yeah. Well, you look like a Viking. You look like a Viking. So you, <laughs> that's what people say. You fit the mold, you know. So it's Brian the Viking. So yeah. I love that. Had you been sick before? I mean, what were your experience of being sick as a kid or your teenage years? Did you not at all? I not at all. was healthy as could be. I, you know, I, when I went into the military, they, they, you know, they vigorously test us before we get in. I was completely healthy when I got into the military. And, you know, I, I've always been one of those people who, who rarely ever catch a cold even. So it was, wow. it was really strange for me later on to, to get this heart issue. And I, I didn't even see it coming. It, it just, it blindsided me. Yeah, because the training to get into the military, I knew early on, being born with only a single functioning ventricle, there was no way I could go to the Air Force and fly airplanes, have that dream of or being in the Navy. And, fly, you know, you see Top Gun as a kid and you're like, I'm going to go be Maverick uh, and uh, get on a motorcycle, get the girl and and everything will be amazing, you know. Uh, but that was out of the cards for me. So I was like, oh, maybe I'm going to be a dentist, you know. Okay, so, uh, some more laid back. Thank God I discovered uh, God gave me the gift of music so I could explore the emotions of all these things. Um, when you were younger, you know, what attracted you to the Army? Was this something that you wanted to do or did you fall into it because it uh, was going to provide education, experience, adventure? No, I always wanted to do it. You know, I, I grew up watching GI Joe. You know, yeah. like that. I I just I've always been a protector. I've I've liked to stand up for people that can't stand up for themselves. So that, that always appealed to me. I I just have 
you know, I've, I've never really cared for bullies. So for me, it was, it was more on standing up for people and protecting people and who better than to protect them than our own country and people that we live by. Were you bullied as a, as a kid at all? Uh, I did have a bully. He, uh, it didn't last real, you know, for a real long time. He was a couple of years older than me. And yeah. as we started to, you know, as I got a little older, he, he decided not to bully me after that. And yeah, I, you do. But, you know, yeah, it was just him really. Yeah. I had a, I had a couple bullies, uh, my, my, because of my heart defect, I had a, a bluish tint making my skin kind of purple. So I had one kid who would call me purple plum. No, 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 no. The girls called me purple plum and that was okay. Cause they were beautiful. There was a guy, he called me raisin. Oh, wow. He just kept going raisin, raisin, raisin. And I, I just, you know, what do you do? You laugh mm-hmm. it off, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's okay. It's fine. You know, um, these things, I guess, shape us and you chose to, to do something about it by going to the military. And, and uh, did you always feel pretty tough to get into the military of the alpha male? Yeah, you know, I, I never really had much of an issue with with the, the toughness part. You know, even in basic training, it the you know they try to break you down a little mentally. And you know, I I ended up telling my drill sergeants they didn't have anything on my mom. She yells more than they do. So, I, <laughs> and not that she's a mean person by any stretch, but you know, it's just there was nothing that they could really bring to me that was going to be something that would challenge me. I I like the physical aspects of it. That that always has appealed to me, but even the the mental part, I knew that they were doing it for my own good because, you know, you can't crack in combat. So it's better to have them push you to the limits and in, in training. And after training, you're in the army. Was there a specialty that you were in? Uh, yeah, I was a military police officer. Wow. The MP. Yep. So I, I really felt I wanted to protect people. Yeah. I, was, I wanted to even protect the, the protectors. So that's, that's why I was drawn into that. Yeah. Did you at that time think of Michael, the archangel? Were you at all? Yeah. You know, I, 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 I saw the uh, emblems. A lot of guys had those, you know, and not being that, you know, not being Catholic at the time, I, I really didn't have a strong appeal to it. Um, you know, I believed in angels, but I, I didn't really understand the whole, the whole Catholic kind of connotation with Michael, the archangel. So it was, you know, more or less something that I just didn't really really get into other than, you know, he was a protector of police and yeah, so, you know, but I, yeah, I, I, I saw it enough. I, I certainly like it a lot more now, but you know, I know him a little bit better. I think I tried to learn a little bit more about it. And so without getting into the near death experience, did you become Catholic before or after that? Before that. Okay. So you're in the army and um, t- was that when you had this, a horrific accident that led to going into the hospital? No, I, um, actually I, I was exposed to toxic chemicals and those toxic chemicals developed into autoimmune disease. So I, I developed several autoimmune diseases, which have now, you know, attacked my body. And that's what ended up destroying my heart. Most of my other organs have been affected, but my heart was completely destroyed and it took quite a few years for it to really catch up to me. What were the chemicals? What were this? What was the situation where you're surrounded by these? It was a toxins. vaccine that they gave us, and it was still in the experimental form, and it just wasn't something that my body could handle very well. Back up. They were giving vaccines to the military. Yeah, it was the anthrax vaccine. Okay, and had it been FDA approved? Had it been tested, or were they testing it on you guys? Well, I. I like to speculate that they were testing on us. They didn't, they wouldn't put it on our shot record. So it was, you know, it was a strange thing to begin with. Um, you know, a lot of my, my sergeants weren't taking it being a, that I was fresh out of basic training when they yeah. gave it to us. I, I really didn't know what to expect, but when I started to pay attention to what, you know, what they were doing and, you know, that we weren't getting one shot on our records, everything else they would stamp with a, a, a stamp to let us know that we got that so they could keep track of it all. Wow. I started saying, well, I'm not going to take this round of this shot. You know, I, I want to see the shot record. And they, they said, you know, take your shot. And they basically kind of threatened me, told me, you know, call me by my rank private, take your shot and move out. And, you know, it was, so it was, it, I was coerced into it and, yeah. you know, I, wasn't wasn't really in a position to say otherwise for defending freedom you didn't have much freedom 
no, you, you know, you you kind of are aware of that. You go into the military, you're their property, and mm-hmm. you know you don't expect them to do that. Right. Of course. Right. Well, you learned. You yeah, learned I definitely learned a, the tough way. And how many other people uh, that you know of were severely affected by this? We have a high percentage of soldiers in in my unit that had had issues from this, and all of them had autoimmune related type of issues. So, you know, it was it's it's pretty pretty serious when you take the the fact that we're all coming from different parts of the country and you know even from different areas of the world all very healthy going in and then having high high percentage of autoimmune disease just doesn't pan out with the general public so it's it's a it's a definitely a concern is the US government doing anything to prevent this do yeah, they investigate uh, I, you know they they do a lot of testing um I've since not cooperated with their tests that, you know, they, they fly me out to different places early on and were, were testing me and, you know, I, they weren't giving me the information back. So even now when I have, you know, my doctors trying to get access to some of the records, there are things that have been sealed that they won't release. Mm-hmm. Um, my, my DNA for one was really strange one. You know, they take your DNA when you go into the military, but when I was coming out, they kept that and they so far have not released what my DNA uh, so I don't even know if my DNA is the same kind of DNA or if it changes. I don't know how that all works a little past my, my pay grade, but yeah. they, they definitely kept it, which is just, it seemed really strange to me that they would withhold that. You didn't serve in New Mexico, did you? <laughs> like, yeah, no, but oh, well. I mean, yeah, there's, there's a history there and you know, it's, it's kind of scary what they, what they do and behind the, the closed doors. Yeah. I, I lived for a, a season on, um, Edwards Air Force Base in California City. And I knew a lot of people that experimented uh, with planes 20 years before they were out. They were flying the stealth, you know, in the early 70s, testing it. And people used to see things and they couldn't say anything. And I guess that's the nature of trying to protect the country from other nations that want to harm the country uh, of knowing our technology and stealing that technology. It's kind of a cat and mouse game that it's unfortunate we have to, to have to protect based on what's happened in the past. You know, I've got a grandfather that fought in the war and got wounded at the Battle of the Bulge and, um, you know, became one of the most successful men, I would say, because he was a uh, faithful to my my grandmother produced a huge family and their trauma created what we have now yeah which is just i mean i go off a little bit but it's amazing so i have so much respect for the military so thank you for your service and it's unfortunate that you got sick but it led you to this period where you needed to get a new heart and so so lead us up to to what happened yeah you know i i definitely don't complain about it because this has been you know an incredible gift to me um but yeah i I ended up getting really sick i i I was running marathons even after the military i i got out of the military they knew that something was wrong um they weren't forthcoming about everything they said i had circulatory and neurological damage coming out of the military so they, they did acknowledge some of that. They had put me on heart medication at one point, but I wasn't waking up. What was the medication? Never, what's, what's that? Do you remember the name of it? Yeah, it was a nephetapine of okay. some sort. Uh-huh. They, uh, yeah, they, wouldn't, they didn't tell me why they were putting up me on it. And I was young, didn't even think to ask what, what a kind of medication it was. I just you know was following orders, stupid kid that I was. But they uh, couldn't wake me up. So they ended up telling me that I was having an allergic reaction, that it was causing me not to wake up. So they decided to discontinue it but all the while you know now we look back in hindsight we can see it while i was having heart issues and you know and and so what has happened is it caused me to have electrical issues with my heart i was getting scar damage in my heart and um so i it just i started having uh, ventricular tachycardia Mm. and you know, I, I'm not sure how long I was in chronic end stage heart failure before I had my first heart event, but I had ran a mile or five miles a week before I had my first heart failure event. And it was a slow five miles. It was tedious. I, and I was sick for a week afterwards, but mm-hmm. then I ended up and I saw, so you know, I, I 
think it was just at some point my body was was telling me I've had enough. I can't can't keep going. And and so I was in really good shape. So I think that helped to buffer what the onslaught of the, the yeah. medical condition. But as soon as I had that first heart failure event, it was it was all over. I just started having problems in, in and out of the hospital for five months. And then I ended up dying five months after that first heart failure event. How old were you? I was 42 at the time. 42. 42. Okay, we're going to stop there. So all of the experience in the army led up to this immune uh, autoimmune disease that eventually took its toll on your body. Um, and you ended up in the hospital and they were about to start really investigating your situation. But I want to back up because at age 27, uh, you became a Catholic. You uh, were no longer part of a non-denominational upbringing. Why Catholicism? You know, I, I really looked into it and and I found just, you know, I liked the, the idea that the, the the apostles could be traced all the way back. You know, the Pope could be traced all the way back. And the, just that handing on of the knowledge directly from Jesus, mm-hmm. that really appealed to me. And then I just saw the beauty of it. You know, there's, I think the Catholic Church gets a lot of, you know, publicity worldwide. Not right. all of it's favorable. And I think, you know, some of it's deserved. There's bad people. I mean, we're we're all fallen. So it's it's not like we're gonna ever escape from that. But I think the the doctrine itself is beautiful. And when you look at what the church teaches versus what you know people sometimes act out, it's it's a really a beautiful faith. And that's what drew me to it. And particularly when you I, the saints, they just they really they just take my breath away and how they love the Lord. And I, you know, that's what I aspire to now. I kind of wish I would have kept on that path, you know, but you know, I, I wasn't such a great Catholic before all this. So. Who's your favorite saint? Oh, I, I love St. Therese of Lisieux. I just, I think she's just wonderful, but they, it's hard for me to pick St. Francis of Sales. I love him too. And oh, you kind of look like St. Francis a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. I'll take that as a compliment. Channel of prayer. What is the song he wrote? St. Francis's prayer, which is such a beautiful piece of music. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I I was introduced to call it Catholicism. I am not Catholic. When I when I married uh, my wife Tina, her entire family is from Slovenia, which is ninety nine point nine percent Catholic, and they carry on the traditions that have been around forever. I mean, the blessing of the Easter basket. Uh, there's no Easter bunny. Everything is all about the Savior, and so I have what one uh, Lutheran leader called holy envy. That's when you have envy of other churches and you kind of wish you could be part of that moment, but maybe not the whole thing. So you kind of want to pick and choose. Um, but I love, uh, I love the consistency that no matter when you go to mass, it's a consistent scenario. And I love that the priest uses the homily to tie the, the calendar of events in the life of Christ altogether. Um, because sometimes if you do not know Catholicism and you go, it feels like everything is out of context, but it's not, it's very well thought out. Uh, the other thing I admire is communion and the reverence with communion and the ability to kneel mm-hmm. kneel and uh, have a moment of prayer, of silence, of gratitude. Um, and I, I, you know, I love the celebration of Christ's victory over death in non-denominational Christianity and a lot of, you know, assemblies of God and all these things uh, in the Protestant movement. But there's something uh, sacred about the communion. And I grew up in the LDS church and I'm not LDS, but there's the Catholics and, and the LDS people have a very similar moment uh, when it comes to communion. And I, I love it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, you hit on a lot of good things. I mean, it, especially with, you know, I can go anywhere in the world and I can go into a, a Catholic church and I'm going to be able to understand what's going on. I might not understand the language, but I'm going to understand everything else about it. And it's beautiful to have that connection with everyone around the world that you can really relate to. And, but that, that reverence to me, it's, you know, even more po- powerful to me now, you know, having had my experience because, you know, I have this 
deeper love for the Lord than I ever probably did before. I, or at least I didn't realize how much I loved him. I, th- I think I, I always have loved him, but you know, it, to see how much he loved me was, it just blew me away. And I, I, I don't, I couldn't see myself now not kneeling before him. I, I, it really just makes me want to do that for him. I love that. And we're going to, I'm going to ask that question. I don't want you to answer it now, but I'm going to ask that question later in this interview of did Jesus, did you have the impression from him that you were supposed to be Catholic or be poor? Does it matter? Does it be part of anything else? So we won't get to that yet because I think people want to know, you know, because the big question men and women always ask us, which of all the churches should I join? Which one is correct? Which one is true? And it can be misinterpreted and interpreted many, many ways. So, um, but let's fast forward. You're, you're very sick. You're in the hospital. And um, um, tell us what happened. Basically, so, just. So, so I, uh, I went to the ER um, and my defibrillator wasn't working at the time. So, you know, it was just below the threshold. So I was in the ER for seven hours fighting to try to get stabilized enough that they could move me up to the ICU. Once they thought they had me well enough under control to, to get me up there, they moved me up. And then I, I went right back into some really high rates of tachycardia. Um, and they, they brought, they brought in the, uh, the crash team. Yeah. And they, they had, you know, called the code blue and, you know, it was, Cardio, they did the cardio version. Yep. They did that a few times. And- did you remember that? Did oh remember? yeah. Okay. I've had that. And I don't mean to stop you, but I've had that many times. It's like 55,000 volts of electricity going right into your body. It's more voltage than the electric chair. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like, incredible. Boom, boom, yeah. And your body's being thrown. It's very intense and the worst feeling in the world, right? Yeah. It, you know, except the first time I ever had it, you know, the, the first heart failure event I had, I, I was over 300 beats per minute. So they thought my heart was really, I mean, it was going to stop any second and they cut my clothes off real quick. And they put me on, put the paddles on me. I I still wasn't quite convinced it was my heart. I just really wasn't sure what was going on. But when they hit me with that one, you know, it hurt, but it brought my heart rate down so quickly. I asked them for another one. I was like, Hey, that felt kind of good. Let me have another one. But you know, when you're in, in the ER, it hurts. I mean, it, it, you know, when they brought me to the ICU and they had me, you know, they, cause they strap you down to a table. So it's really uncomfortable, you know, and you, you feel kind of like the wizard of Oz, you know, when they got the scarecrow in the dark woods and they're throwing their arms and legs all over the place. And you really f- realize you're, you're kind of like a, like pray for a pack of wolves, you know, they're, they're all over you, but that, that intense pain, I mean, it's like white searing lights just blasting you. It's, terrible it's like you know it's 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 a rough it's a rough experience yeah yeah but it sounds like you uh to get the relief it's amazing how much pain you needed to get the relief and such an analogy for life so many times we need to be really shaken back into our reality we need to be woken up out of the deep sleep that we've put ourselves into in order to focus and reevaluate what matters most, we have to crash and burn so mm-hmm. Jesus can raise us up. Yeah, especially because we, we always think we know what's best, you know, and yeah. even as, as a child, I always thought I knew what was the best. And I, I realize now, no, my parents had a lot more going on than I, than I gave them credit for. And, you know, and I, I realized that with God, he knows what's better for me and I can't predict the future. He knows what's going to unfold and which direction he needs me to go. And, you know, and I, if, if I just would get out of my, out of, or out of his way, get out of my own way, yeah. I, life always has been better for me. Up to this point, how much of the Bible had you read? Were you pretty immersive in it or? You know, as, as a, as a kid, you know, I, I learned quite a bit of verses, but not really putting it all together. Um, you know, and when I was in my, my teenage years and my early twenties, I really had, had kind of deviated from the faith. I wanted to have the faith cookie cuttered. I wanted it to, you know, suit my needs so I could still go out and be a young man and do the things I wanted to do. Um, 
as I, as I became Catholic, I really started, I mean, they re, we read the Bible every, every mass. So we hear quite a bit of the Bible. And so I started to really pick up quite a few more things, mm-hmm. but it, it, it didn't really come alive as, as it has now. Um, you know, really hearing, hearing the words that God told me there. And it, it, it's, 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 you know, I certainly, I think my faith has been strengthened, which makes me realize that that's his, his inerrant word, you know, it's infallible. It comes right from God. So it, it speaks to my heart in a way that maybe I, I let it now, I, instead of trying to twist it my own, my own way. And do you think it takes these types of experiences, getting sick, hit, crashing for us to start to, to, to use it as an instruction manual versus just something that we, you know, I, I like, for example, people, and I know for myself, I'll go do something I'm not supposed to do. Um, and then I'll go, man, I gotta, I gotta not do that again. So I'll pick up the Bible and I'll just read a couple verses and I'll start to feel better about myself. I'll listen to Christian music. I'll do whatever. Um, you know, maybe it's just something that I, I got mad at somebody or I swore and I shouldn't have sworn publicly <laughs> or something. And so, but, but there's something to be said about immersing yourself in it so that you understand the personality and the character of Jesus Christ, who the whole story is about. Yeah. I, I think you're right. It's, it, you know, it's identifying that, you know, he lived a life, you know, here's God living a human life too, just so he can identify with us and show us how to, to, to do better in our own lives. And, you know, I think sometimes, at least for me, I felt so distant from God, you know, like he's way up there and I'm down here. And I, I just, I didn't, allow myself to really connect with what he, what he reveals to us in the Bible. And I see a lot of other people and I'm kind of envious of them. You know, it took something drastic for me to be able to have my eyes open, but there's so many other people out there with beautiful faith and, and they didn't see. And I'm just, I know that there's so much truth to, to what Jesus said that, you know, more blessed are they because, you know, they, they didn't have to see in order to believe and, I, I think that they're going to have a wonderful reward when they get to heaven. It, yeah. I, I think of my mom. My mom yeah. has the gift of faith, just the ability to believe uh, without failure in the divine. And uh, she has such a special relationship that when she was always at my bedside, she would basically say, the Lord is doing something beautiful. And you're in pain and you're like, what do you mean? You know, but you go along because you're a good kid and um, and you don't want to make them feel pain from what you're suffering. And so you stay optimistic. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you're c- correct. And so many of our listeners have that extra ordinary faith. And there are people that listen that uh, have yet to experience uh, the joy of of knowing these things. Um, so let's, let's get into, so, so was this near death experience before the transplant or was it after? Yeah, it was two years before the transplant. Okay. Yeah. And you know, after, after I had that, that, that cardiac arrest, they, uh, you know, they had mentioned a few times, you know, we probably need to get you on the transplant list. And when they took a peek at my heart and realized the damage that it, that it had, it, it was pretty obvious I wasn't going to make it. But you know what? Jesus didn't tell me that he, he said he's going to give me a new heart. He didn't say it was going to be one that wasn't mine. I thought he was going to just miraculously cure mine. So I was really <laughs> holding out. Right. And, you know, it took a while for me to really realize that, you know, it's not always my way of thinking. He's got plans ahead of me. And, and you know, and I, I don't know. I, I think that this actually has been such a wonderful thing because two years for me to suffer, I'll send you a picture of my heart so you can see how bad it was yeah. for the, the doctors. They looked at it and they, when they got, you know, they had PET scans before they didn't really see the damage the way that they did when they did the, uh, the biopsy on it afterwards, but they said this heart was unfunctional. It, there's no way with all the scar tissue that I had, it was, it was really like I had a piece of beef jerky for a heart. It was just completely destroyed. 
Yeah. Casualties of working in the military. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's, it was amazing though, that, you know, that God had my hand, my heart in his hand, that whole two years that I was waiting for a heart transplant. And it was, it was really wonderful. So you're in the ER. Is this, let's talk about the near death experience. Is this, is this when it happened? Yeah. Um, the near death experience was when I was in that coming out of the ER into the ICU. Okay. So you crashed and you, you died. Yeah. And what do yep. you remember? Well, I, I remember a, a shake and a pop and then my soul exited my body. Um, and that was, you know, that was pretty intense, but it, it was like just a real sudden burst of pain. And then it was gone. It was total love and peace and joy, just flooding, flooding into me all around me. I was just immersed in love and joy and, and silence. It was wonderful how quiet things had gotten for me, you know, cause in the hospital room, it was chaotic. It was terrible. Yeah. It was just, it was really, really traumatic to even have just that much chaos going on. And then it was completely silent after that. So that was, that was wonderful. So the snap and the pop, you know, there are a lot of people have had these moments where um, they talk about the snap and the pop when they return, the pain when they return, but not exiting the body. Yeah, it was, it was real quick, but it was, it was something that I felt like it hit me. I knew I had left my body. Okay. It, there was no mistaking it. Um, it wasn't nearly like what I felt when I came back, but that's because I held on to what I had when I came back. So okay. it was, you know, it was a different, different sensation, but it was, it was so, so sudden that I knew that I was dying and then dead immediately after that. Have you thought about, have you thought about why the body seems to be so attached to the soul, the spirit, um, for for a lot of people that are unfamiliar with what I'm talking about, is if you take a pair a glove uh, and you put a glove over your hand, the glove would be the flesh, would be the body, and and when the body dies, you're going to put that you're going to take that glove off and you're going to put it in the grave, but who you really are continues and moves and um, and um, so so that detachment though that that what do you, is it, what do you think? Have you thought about what that really means? Why it's so painful for the spirit to leave the body? You know, I, I, I can resonate with it even, even now, you know, that we're so physically attached to, to this world. You know, it, it really draws us. We, you know, we have to eat, we have to breathe. We, you know, we have to have our blood circulate. There's a lot of things that have to happen for us to, to stay functioning but we really try to satisfy our flesh quite often. You know, if I, I think about even running a marathon, you know, you get tired and you start to say, well, maybe I should just slow down or I should, you know, stop altogether. And, you know, we, we tell ourselves a lot of things, but once you real get past a certain point in a marathon, you, you realize, no, I can keep going. It's just, my brain's trying to tell me to conserve this energy, but I have plenty of energy. It's just trying to make sure I don't overdo it for if, if famine hits or something, something more drastic. But I think it's, it's this, this, like you said, we, we have to have a detachment. And I think often we don't practice that in, in our society for one, but it's, it's something that, you know, you have to actively do, you have to have some self-discipline to be able to have some, some detachment in life. And that's one of the greatest lessons I think I have from this, this whole experience is that, I've, I've kind of grown into a, a love for mortification to really challenge myself to, to experience things without having to fill that, that hole that we seem to have in our lives with these things around us, because now it's, it's filled with God. I, I, it's something that I'd rather feed my spiritual spirituality and that relationship with God than with things. I think about after my transplant, I realized you can buy things, you can have nice things, but you can't carry those around with you. But if you invest in, you know, a, a vacation or a memory with your child, your spouse, you'll carry that memory everywhere. And they will also. And, uh, you know, that's why we do a lot of what I call all, all heart adventures. 
you know, you have to put your whole heart into your life experience to be more fulfilled because God created this incredible world for us to enjoy. And we work like, like what, like we're trying to gain the world when it doesn't even belong to us. Um, so I totally relate with what you're saying. Um, okay. So you left your body. What happened next? So then I'm, you know, I'm in this dark tunnel and I was staring at a dark void and, you know, it took me a while to realize that I had 360 degree vision. My, all my senses had, had seemed to improve. Um, you know, I, I was immediately more intelligent than I ever could have even dreamed of being, but it was, it wasn't confusing. You know, I had all my memories about me. It, it's as if, you know, we have a million thoughts in our lives, you know, and we have all these memories and ideas and desires and hopes. And, you know, we don't access them all at once there. I could, I could access everything all at once, but it wasn't, it wasn't confusing because, you know, you could still focus on one thing, but have everything else there. So it wasn't like it just fell away and you didn't think about it for several more years, but it didn't, it didn't overwhelm you with, with confusion. So it was, it was more clear and, and just coherent yet so much variety of, of thoughts. But, you know, I, I was just staring at a dark void and I remember telling myself that, you know, it was sort of a thought, but it was more than just a thought. But I, I said, this can't be it. And what I was really saying is that I didn't want this without Jesus. Cause I had felt him before I died. I, I was looking at a crucifix and I was praying and, you know, I felt, I felt Jesus presence with me and I felt it even more now that I was dead. And so I, you know, I knew I was dead. There was no question about it. And I'm staring at this dark void that was, you know, trying to lure me to just stay comfortable and stare at nothingness. And once I had said that this can't be it, I realized I could see this brilliant light right behind me. And it was where the, the love was emanating from this light. And as soon as I saw that, I, I just said, I, I went and make it a turn to look at the light, which I didn't even need to do. Cause it's, you know, I turned, which maybe I did need to do it because it was like a physical action, you know, a choice of going to the light. But, uh, I didn't actually have to because I could see the dark void behind me as soon as I turned. So it wasn't as if I ever lost view of it, but I, I feel like, you know, it was something that I, my soul had to make this decision because even that, that statement, it all was coherent. You know, when I tell my story, it's often that I have to tell it in this linear fashion, but everything happens almost simultaneously. There was really no sense of time. It was, it was totally out of whack. And so you know, I, I would say it's kind of like time was on a, a, you know, you take a pen and you draw a little dot on the paper. That's, that's basically everything happens in that dot, yet it's so much more vast than, than a dot. And time is irrelevant anyways, because if you lived on Jupiter and I asked how your day was, you'd say it was pretty long. You know, you would be a different age than me, even though if we were born at the same time. So, and what does that even mean? Because we think of, uh, you know, the ring, a ring is round. Uh, the Bible says uh, one eternal round. And a couple of things I want to clarify, uh, maybe listeners, you guys picked up as well, is that you had, when you left your body, you had a 360 um, understanding of all the senses. Everything, all your thoughts came into clarity at one time. You could access all those thoughts in a way the uh, computer holds all the data and all the information understands exactly how to access it at any time that to me answers the question of how god is able to know what we are doing and and what we need and and all those things at the same time he's helping somebody else um because there is no linear time it's all relevant to now the the past the present the future it's all before him now and he is able to do what he needs to do to customize this curriculum for you to teach you the things you most need to know in order to get you where you will have the most amount of joy 
Um, and this is a, uh, from a from a discourse by a man named Neil Maxwell that he gave in 1974 at uh, in Provo, Utah. One of my favorite uh, discourses. It's but for a small moment, but he talks about these things and it resonates with me. But the, the other thing is that it's such a parallel to this baptism scenario when Jesus is talking about um, with Nicodemus. Jesus and Nicodemus are together. Nicodemus is part of the uh, Sanhedrin. He's asking Jesus, you know, to explain himself. And Jesus is saying, you need to be born again. And he references the womb, that we were once in the womb. And we were completely immersed in water. And it was dark. And, and yet we see this marvelous light. And, and uh, the water breaks. And we come out of the womb. Um, into the light, into this world, and we're born again. And that death experience seems to have such a significant symbolic um, look back of creation, of, 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 of what your mother and father, through the grace of God, brought forth in the womb to burst, burst forth. And so here you have this almost new born again experience but you're dead and you're traveling now towards this light like an infant coming yeah to a new experience so so what happens as you go forward to that light well i i traveled really quickly although you know i didn't have any g force or any kind of acceleration that i i felt i didn't feel wind on my face or anything that would give me the impression that i was moving as quickly as i did but i was there with the light in an instant although i still do remember taking every single step so again it was just bizarre for the the relevance of time just didn't exist you know there, there was nothing to to really base that off of but i was standing before the light and you know i could see in so many directions i could see the distance is un uncalculable. I can't tell you how far it was, but I was also looking, you know, at the light at the same time as I'm looking, trying to find the the, the ends of this light. Hmm. But I'm I'm looking at it, and I I knew it was God, or at least some manifestation of God. I, I didn't see a body or a face or anything, so I I can't say that that exactly was you know the, the beatific vision. I don't think that's what it what I was looking at, but it was definitely the love, and it was emanating from, from the source, which was, was God. So I was interacting with God. And as soon as I made that recognition, he, he said that I could enter the light. And as I entered the light, I mean, I could feel him permeating into my soul. I mean, it was palpable. It wasn't like this light was just, you know, like the light illuminating my room. It was, it was just this beautiful, like flow of love and peace and joy flowing into me. I, I, I really have to describe it as, as being like a straw, you know, when you drink from a cup and you, you know, you're drinking through a straw. Imagine if you had a bottomless cup, never goes empty. Hmm. That that's God's love is, is inside that cup and you're the straw and it's just constantly filled. You're never, you know, you never goes out of your, where you're, you're at some point have no, you know, like a gap of the, the love. It's constantly full. The straw is always full. And, for all of eternity, that's what I, I really feel like we're going to constantly feel this rejuvenation of his love because he's infinite. And so it, it made me realize that I'm never going to not, not feel this just excitement of this new, new experience of love and God in some different way that, that I couldn't possibly have grasped, you know, moments before. So, and, that, and that, that moment, that experience of, of feeling that love, that, that like you, you know, you're sipping out of a straw, and it seems like the cup is never ending. It's flowing into you. Um, remember, Jesus travels for miles just to meet a woman at a well, and uh, this is Jacob's well. This is where they would draw water, and people would walk for miles to get water because they were thirsty. And here's Christ, and and what is what does he tell her? You know. He basically yeah. says, whoever will drink of this well, they'll be thirsty, you know, but whosoever drinks of the love that I have to give you will never thirst. And so that, me, at that moment, answers how he's able to do that. It permeates, you know, but I do have the question, like, of you're in that 
And because we think of it as a time linear thing, you know, the end, you know, alpha and omega, which is Latin for beginning and end, do you think at some point you would get tired or you would get sick of or you'd want to change that feeling to an alternate feeling? I can't imagine wanting anything other than that. It's, you know, I, I crave it now even. I, you know, the, the only reason I even chose to come back was because I wanted to do more for that love. Okay. That, that love was so powerful. And, and it only got better the, the longer I was there. The more that I experienced that love, it just kept kept getting stronger and, and more powerful. And, you know, I, I, I don't, I can't imagine ever getting tired of it. It, it seemed as if I would never be tired of it. Okay. So it wasn't a consistent, it was an increasing, it was yeah. increasing and increasing. Wouldn't your heart just explode from the love? <laughs> yeah. I luckily my heart was already dead. So <laughs> that's, you know, cause I, I can't imagine I, even when, you know, when I was, when I came back, I, I had so much ecstasy just from this experience you know it lasted for a week or more that i just felt this just wonderful feeling but it the, that craving that i have now i i i can't i can't even i can't even describe to you how how much i want that and yet you know i'm willing to do what whatever god has in store for me because i just i'm willing to endure and to to suffer anything even being separated and for this time, just so I could share his love with others. Cause that's what he really wants is, you know, he wants people to, to fall in love with him and to, to be with him and not, not to be, you know, fallen away. Why do you think he created this experience for us? Why, why are we here? Well, you know, I, I honestly think it goes back to Adam and Eve, you know, they, they made a choice to go out of that communion with God. Um, you know, and it's, it's something that, you know, I don't blame them for it because I know I would have made that choice if, had they not already have done it. You know, I'm, I'm pretty willful, but I, I, you know, I think we were created to be in communion with God, not to be in this fallen world that we, we are in. This is, this is a result of sin. So I think, you know, when, when we look at how we choose to live our lives, none of us are perfect, you know, and we, we do things that, that, are contrary to what we know our conscience is telling us to do. Yeah. And that just constantly separates us from God until we repent and, and make ourselves, you know, right with him again. But so I, I think that, you know, the, but the purpose is, is to, to suffer like he did, you know, he came down, he showed us how to suffer, how to get to heaven. You know, it's, the cross is more of a ladder than anything else. It shows us the way to get there. And, you know, what a beautiful God to actually take that on and say, Hey, here's, here's the way, not that I'm going to make you do it without giving you an example. I'm going to come and show you how to do it. So that way it makes it, makes it something that we can all look up to and say, all right, if our God can do it and he was sinless, then why can't I endure the, you know, losing my cell phone or whatever else we have to endure today? <laughs> yeah. God forbid we lose the, 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 the yeah. The yeah. Um, was there any indication or feeling that, you know, you talked about Adam and Eve um, and you say we, is there any indication that we may have existed prior to that in some form uh, to Adam and Eve? Like, uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. Meaning, do you feel that there's some type of pre-existence for all of us that even though you, you, you came to conscience, you know, at birth, even at birth, we don't know reality it's usually third three four four right. years old that we actually start to have memory and it increases um and so we lose any knowledge of the womb i'm wondering if in this near-death experience if you felt that there was a, a some type of pre-existence for us you know i can't say for myself i i did have experiences that i was seeing of other people's lives but they weren't mine. So, you know, everything in history, I, I had an awareness of things that were in history. Um, but, you know, I, I didn't, I, I don't, I can't say that I saw anything for myself prior to, to my own, my own existence in life. That, okay. that doesn't mean I, I didn't, I, maybe that was closed off to me. I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah. So you didn't have any memory of it or it was just so, uh, not made known to you. Um, yeah, that's, that's interesting. Did you recognize, who did, did you recognize anybody or was it just all light or you know, did you feel anybody near you? 
I, there was there was a lot of people that were there. Um, I did recognize people, but I was so focused on Jesus. So when I saw Jesus, I couldn't take my eyes off of him. Yeah. And I, 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 everything else is kind of in the periphery. So like when I was there, I had all this awareness, but I was only able to take back what I focused on and everything else is kind of a, a blur to me. Um, yeah. Cause I was, I was laser focused on Jesus. I mean, he was so beautiful and so loving that I, I just couldn't take my eyes off of him. In your book, uh, Sudden Death to Paradise, which you've, is available, um, anyone who wants to get even more in depth of what Brian experienced, um, you, you've got to get the book. And then you also lay out on your YouTube channel a very, there's no interview, it's just you telling the, the story of what happened. So that's that's one way to get it. But the book is the book is fascinating. Now the thing I want to ask, um, in addition to, to plugging that book, is uh, you talk about a ladder. Um, you you feel in coming away from that, you feel like Jesus has given us this ladder to climb. Some people will argue that that's legalism. That it's uh, and, and then churches will use legalism to create a prosperity gospel which is basically you got to do this and this and this as well as pay us to get the blessings to get the blessings and so there's a lot of warning in scripture against that so i want to clarify the type of legalism that you're referencing when you say that he's given us a ladder what exactly are you are you saying is it uh and i'll softball this for you is it to to do the best you can to keep the commandments he's given us it, or how much is grace associated with it? Oh, grace is, grace is the, the absolute pinnacle of everything. And, you know, without grace, there's no way we're ever going to be successful. It's, it's not like God's cruel. He's, he understands our fallen nature and, but he gives us these graces. It's, it's a matter of whether we choose to use them or not. And I can say from my life, I chose often to ignore the graces or take credit for them, you know, and say that they came from within me. And, you know, I, I realized there that I'm really pretty much nothing. I, without God, I will step on anybody to get what I want. And yeah. I will justify it in so many ways that it, it will seem like you're wrong. And I'm right, but I'm the one who's stepping on you when it really comes down to it. But you're the bad guy, you know. It's it's just that's that's how I can get. And you know, I think I think a lot of us can be that way because it's hard to see past the end of our own nose. You know, we are living life from our own perspective, so things are coming in, and we're we're the ones who are in charge of evaluating it. So we tend to skew it in our own favor. But that that grace is so beautiful because I'm looking at now how. I try to live my life in, in a way that benefits other people. I, I don't need to go out and be the one who gets to choose what we do for every, every event. I don't need to be the one who's the first one to go when it gets to a green light. You know, I just, I don't need to be, be first all the time anymore, especially when I realize that it, somebody else could benefit from that. And I'm willing to just take a step back. And I think that's kind of, what it's about is, you know, denying ourselves a little bit, you know, not, not going and saying, I have to be the most important all the time, because that's just, is that's not a realistic thing. There's a you know, trillion other people, a couple trillion here on earth. You know, we, we, we can't possibly really believe that we should be first in everything. Yeah. And yet it's hard for us as human beings not to. It's our survival mentality. Yeah, absolutely. It's our, our human flesh nature that uh, was passed down from us, from uh, Adam and Eve to us, uh, the natural man or the natural woman. Um, so in terms of the latter, and those are obviously latter things, which are, you know, just don't be a jerk. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Be kind like Christ to be forgiving and to be slow to react, which is not always easy. You know, the fruits of the gospel, be patient kind and loving um when you were there knowing that you were catholic uh two questions one did you get a sense that it mattered what religion you were part of uh you know for the for the 
person who is listening who is Islamic or Jewish or uh, Hindu, you know, does it matter when they go to heaven at, at, in that moment of what you experienced? I can't say what it, what it's going to be like for anyone else. I, I tend to believe that, you know, everyone's going to be there in that dark void looking or in that dark tunnel, looking at that dark void. And I, I really feel like that choice that I made, you know, being Catholic didn't save me. I can say that for sure. It, it oh. wasn't like I was going to be guaranteed to go to heaven just because I was Catholic. So I, I honestly think I could have stayed there looking at that dark void, just feeling that love and that joy. And yet I don't know that, you know, once the final judgment comes that, okay, you chose not to come to me. I, so what I guess I'm saying is I, I think that perhaps even somebody who's, who's a good, good person, but they're not of my faith or not even Christian, if they see that light and they, they say, wow, I, I really am interested in that light. I want to go to that light. And then they see Jesus standing there. I can't imagine them saying like me, I couldn't take my eyes off them. I can't imagine anyone else not doing that as well. Now, are they going to be a Muslim when they're there? No, I, I, they're all going to be Christian because they're going to say, well, Jesus is the truth. He's the way he's the life. And so that I truly believe, but does that mean that somebody who's a Muslim isn't going to go to heaven? I, I can't say that. I think that they're going to see Jesus. I don't know why anybody would refuse to, to go there. I think it's, yeah. I think it's going to be a choice to stay there looking in that darkness. Which, which basically answers the question that there may be confusion in the next life of who God is, but then God gives everybody the opportunity to feel the gospel which is the good news, which is that there, you've conquered the grave, that you're alive. You're not, you, your body is dead, but you are alive. You're more alive than ever. You're feeling this overwhelming love. You kind of resonate with what it was because you've had some experience with God in your moral life. And now you're feeling this. You see this light. You choose. I know what this is. I'm going towards it. And, and you see trillions of, you know, your book, uh, trillions of people in all this light and love. And then you're zoned in completely on the son of God, uh, Jesus, uh, who, who is, is God. And um, anyone, everyone is offered that um, because this is the creator of mankind is basically what what you're saying, which ought to bring comfort and more patience to those proselyting uh, to trust more in God's ability to love his children better than we can. Absolutely. That's for sure. I, you know, I realized that you know, even with my own children, he loves them more than I do. That's, that, that was apparent. And I never would have imagined anybody could love my kids more than me. You know, I, I would have done anything for my kids, still would, but he loves them way more than I love them. And that's that's where I think the comfort really comes from, is that knowing that he loves them like that and that I he loves me that way, he loves you that way, he loves everybody, even people who d despise him, he still loves them. He doesn't like the fact that they despise him. He doesn't like the fact that, you know, I, I do sinful things too. He doesn't like those things, but he sees our soul. That's the, our soul. Those things are just the things that we're doing, you know, and we can repent from those and those are gone. And, you know, and he's just sees our soul. And that's the part that he loves, but he loves us all. He doesn't want to lose one of us. And that's, you know, for me, I, I want to be able to try to just help everybody. I don't care who, who they are, what faith they are. I just want them to start to love God, you yeah. know, and it, I just want that because that makes him happy. That's what he wants. He just wants all of us to, to be there. And those feelings that you had, the overwhelming sense of love you experienced, you know, I'm sure listeners are wondering, how can I feel what you felt? Because you've said you've had moments where you have felt that. When was the last time you had glimpses of that, that love? Like in this life again? Yeah, when, that, you came, when you came back from that experience, when... When, when, or how can people access or feel what you felt? Because you can get, you know, it's kind of like 
I remember my, uh, this is maybe a poor analogy, but my parents went to Israel, Israel when I was a kid, it was 1979, and they brought back, I, I believe it was a little glass, and it had in it water from the Dead Sea. And so we could see a little bit of Israel in that glass to know it was real. You know what I mean? And we experience supernatural feelings. Um, elevated emotion is what scientists call it. I don't care what you call it. You have these intense feelings where you know it's the divine. It's a higher power. Uh, how do you act? When I'm trying to get to how people can feel what you experienced, what do they need to do? Well, I, I have experienced it in prayer at times. Not always, you know, prayer sometimes is difficult. It's, it's sometimes, you know, a, a tedious thing. Mostly I, I've, I've found it though in actions, mm -hmm. you know, and I try to live my life as a prayer. So it's not that I, I just, I'm always on my knees praying, but you know, I, I work with the homeless now. And when I've, I've, I've not, not every homeless person allows me to, to really help them. You know, sometimes it's, it can be a real process and there's, you know, sometimes some selfishness on, and so it's, it's, it doesn't give you that, that good feeling. Right. But there's, there's sometimes when you see somebody so vulnerable and they open themselves up to you and you really see who they are. And I've, I've started to sometimes see how God must see that person. And, and when I've seen that, that open up to me, it makes me fall in love with them. And I think that's when I felt that closeness again with, with God is that it's that love exchange between me and this other person. And I know God's there. I know he's within that. And that's the thing, you know, we think that we, we understand love, but we really don't have a clue. Our yeah. love is, is always with a price tag. It's got some kind of, you know, it's got some give and take and if people don't give us what we want. We pull our love away. God doesn't do that. He's always giving that love. But when you're, when, or at least for me, when I've, when I've re reached somebody who's, who's hurting and, you know, I, I just have felt God there and that that's opened it up to where I, I start to now try to look for a person's virtue, not, not what I'm seeing, you know, as a human being, not, not as that, that faulty things that we all see, or even not my own judgment of what I'm seeing. But I try to look for their virtue because we all have different virtues. We all do things for certain reasons, but there's often some beauty behind some of these things. If we take the time to look as opposed to, you know, getting caught up in some of the exterior things that turn us off from each other. And that's where I, I think we find God more often than not. I remember going to uh, a bishop when I was a college student, I needed to confess of some things and he said look just get out get involved in the in the church start serving people and you'll get that feeling back and i did i went out and i started serving i forgot about my my miserable stupid mistake and i felt cleansed in the service of other people and and you know christ obviously said whoever has done it unto the least of these my brethren or, or sisters has done it unto me um and then last Sunday, TJ Timms, who is the pastor of Emmanuel Nashville, if anyone listening, this was probably one of the best sermons I've heard uh, on, on service and why it's important to, uh, to serve. And he, he paralleled the cross, you know, with the cross you have going upward, it's this fellowship with God. But to have true fellowship with God, he wants it to be horizontal. He wants us to fellowship with one another, which basically means in heaven, because you, you get into this in your book, everyone knows everybody's sins. Yeah. And when you are so naked in your sins, and everybody knows every dark secret, because we all have dark secrets, there seems to be this compassion mm -hmm. that is so overwhelming and consuming that we start to heal one another because people say, how in the world will this world be cleansed of all the pain when we have hurt each other? How will 
parents who have fought and, and abused each other and divorced and hurt their children, how will they ever find redemption and feel that? And there seems to be this overwhelming sense with any near-death experience that have people that have gone into these atmospheres where God is, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that the love that permeates from Him down to us when we have that go to our neighbor. Love God, love your neighbor. Love God, love your neighbor. That's where all the cleansing yeah. truly takes place. Confession. Yeah, you're not wrong. Yeah, you're you're not wrong at all. I mean, that's to me. I I I'm able to to endure things from people that I never would have been able to do before. You know, I, I, if somebody wronged me, I I would be quick to tell them that they were wrong. I, I didn't I didn't like it. You know, I wasn't afraid to stand up for myself. I'm still not afraid to stand up for myself. I just don't feel the need to. I I'd rather find out. You know, how can I help this person in a different way? Not pointing the finger at them because that usually doesn't work, you know, especially if people get defensive, mm -hmm. but sometimes just killing them with kindness. It's, it's a way to, to soften people. It changes their whole outlook because people are used to this friction and this conflict. And, you know, our world is, is always, it seems at, at odds with each other, but when somebody's kind to you, despite how you're being, you kind of realize, you know, I've been a bit of a, butt. I got to, you know, maybe maybe change things up. And they wow. do, people do. It's, it's unbelievable how many people will respond to a smile when they've been crabby to me. And, you know, and I, I don't get caught up in the, well, they treated me this way and start thinking of all the reasons why they don't like me. I, I think, you know, maybe they, maybe they got it. They're constipated or they're who knows what, you know, I try to think of something that puts it into a human perspective that it's something else other than me that's causing this person to be, to be kind of grumpy. And, you know, I, I think that helps me to, to really get past that, that, that rough edge yeah. and look for that virtue that, that they have hidden in there. And, and when you can find it, it's so much easier to, to be that, that bar going across, you know, to, to be there and help hold each other up because we really do. We need each other. It's, 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 it's a communion together because that's, that's ultimately the way God has set this up, you know, didn't put us out here as, as being little individuals that need to just run, you know, our, our own race per se. We need to, we need to be able to help carry each other a little bit too, and carry that cross for each other. And it's part of this clarification. I want to clarify from my own thoughts is that Christ called each of us stones and he is the chief cornerstone and he's building this incredible kingdom, this temple, and he's laying the stones and he, he takes each of us as a stone, which is interesting, ironically, because they would use stones in the law of Moses to, to kill people. He would use the stones in this scenario to bring people back to life. And he would light these stones and build this building. And it is though that Jesus, um, it's been said, he doesn't need you. But I don't think that's correct. I think he wants you. He desires you. And we are part of him in such a powerful way that he talks about, you know, the body of Christ. And there are many parts. Yes, absolutely. And so God is with us. We are with God. If you've seen the Father, you've seen me. So will it be with all of us as stones. We are, we are all part of the God that we worship. You know what I mean? Like it's, we, we are, because the, the heart that you had was removed. It was infected. God replaced it with another stone. Yeah. To keep the flow for his glory. And I love it because he needs us. We need him. It's not like I'm sending you guys out on this adventure. I'm going out with you. Yeah. We're going. Yep. And, and he's still with us. That's, that's the beautiful thing is that, you know, I, I, I was going to bring that up if, if you hadn't, but the, the body needs, you know, has many different parts, but, you know, even thinking about like a heart, my, my heart can't pump unless my brain does, does the, the work for it, but I don't have to think about it. 
I don't have to sit there and concentrate on my heartbeat all the time. If I did, that would be exhausting. I would never get anything else done in my life. I would be sitting there thinking about my heart going all the time. You know, I, I wouldn't be able to pay the bills or go to work or talk to my family. But these these things, there's 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 a there's a, a flow to how our body operates with itself. And you know, it's it's nice to have two hands to be able to tie my shoes. It, it would be hard for me to figure that out if I if I didn't have two hands, although people can do it. But I, I would probably choose to have Velcro shoes just because it would be too much for me at this point in my life to try to learn something like that. Yeah. And, and I see that with, with other people, even, even when, you know, we can often as a society discard homeless people. And I, I think that's what has drawn me to them. But when I see how much more I get from them than they probably do from me, that's, that's a, a wonderful thing to, to have that, that, that rekindling of, of brotherhood to yeah. see that, you know, God has, has a purpose for everyone. Every human life is a value to God. And if we don't see it, then that's our fault and that's our failure. And, and we just need to look a little bit harder to be able to see it from God's eyes, you know, and often that's one of the prayers I ask is I ask God to, you know, give, fill my eyes with his light so I can see as he sees and fill my heart with his love so I can love as he loves, because if I do that or am able to do that the way that he wants, everything opens up for me. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, why wait to feel that love in the dark void? Yeah. When you can experience it now. No. Yeah. That, yeah. Is, that, that is the passion behind what you're, what you're saying and what this podcast is all about. We want to find people that have been given unique gifts that are using those gifts uh, to, that really defines their purpose. And, it, you know, Brian, you're doing amazing work. You came back out of that near-death experience. And then how, how, how long before you were listed for a heart? Um, well, I, I, I got it two years, a little over two years, two, about two years and two months after that. So I, I went on the heart transplant list um, two, exactly two years after I had died. And once I, it took two months for me to get the heart. They had a couple coming in, but none wow. of them seemed to be be a good fit. And finally, the, the day that I ended up getting the call, I told them, I said, don't, cause they had gotten one that night and then they turned it down. I said, don't turn down the next one. I'm not going to make it. I knew I was really getting close. You know, you talked about how your skin was blue and that's what my body was. I have tattoos all over the place, you know, and I mean, you, you can see them. I got them all over when I, you could not tell I had tattoos that when I ended up getting the transplant, the, the doctors are like, well, you got a lot of tattoos. I'm, I'm like, yeah, you didn't see me before. They're like, no, we couldn't tell. Was, I was like all gray and ashen colored. And right. My, my body just didn't look right. And I knew I was going to die. I knew I wasn't going to make it much longer. And, you know, luckily God, God had that plan for me. And it, you know, it's, it works out perfectly. What do you know about your donor? Not a whole lot. I, I know that there was some, some risk that, that, you know, like they didn't, you know, obviously I didn't have, they didn't have HIV or anything. They didn't have, but they were, they had lived an indigent life. Okay. So, um, you know, maybe that's why I feel so strongly for, for ho the homeless. Yeah. Um, but the, the family hasn't gotten a hold of me. I did write a letter and I just haven't heard anything back. Yeah. Neurologists will now have verified that the human body carries DNA memory within every organ so when your heart uh, that you experienced life in, uh, in encoded into that dna is memory meaning if you learn to ride a bicycle you'll always know how to ride a bicycle if you experience some type of emotion with a mom or or a family member whether it's traumatic or or beautiful that's engraven into the dna coding now, when your heart is removed from your chest, it's clinically proven now that you carry with you the DNA memory of that individual. So uh, my mother will say that I'm a lot different than I was. And obviously that's because I used to feel like I drove around a beat up old pickup truck and then they gave me the keys to a Porsche because you know, my heart was half my age. He was a state amateur boxing champion, very healthy. Um, and um, I get this new heart, but he suffered from depression and uh, took his life. And so 
I started to feel these things, but now I recognize that it's not me. It's something that I carry within me that uh, it's almost like the cross to bear in order to continue on. And so I've had scientists vindicate that, and it's fascinating. Have you had, I mean, you've got compassion for the homeless, you've got com much more compassion, obviously, this experience you had, but have you noticed any other change? Has your family noticed any change in you? Yeah, they. I'm. I used to be like a dog on a bone when it comes to getting my way. Um, you know, I I thought I was more persuasive than I probably was, but because everybody else seemed to think I was, you know, really wanted my own way a lot. But I was pretty persuasive. It's just now I I I'm willing to just endure a lot more than I ever would have before. And I I don't know if that's just because of, you know seeing seeing life closely ended and now I want to add more things to it. Um, but I do know that I have this compassion for people that goes deeper than just wanting to protect them. You know, I, I'm, I'm willing to allow people to, to kind of have to go through their own motions in life and, you know, pick up, pick up their own, their own way and not, you know, do everything for them. So that's, that's kind of a, a different, different thing for me. Cause I used to like to help in such a more, uh, I don't know, like forceful way, not, not really forceful, but I, I yeah. Yeah. It was more of a, a teller. And now it's, I, I like people to figure things out on their own, you know, and yet be there as, as like a, a hand up, not a hand out kind of person. Got it. Got it. Yeah. It's interesting. The journey. And um, one last thing I want to share before we conclude when I was in my darkest moment, trying to understand how I could accept the heart of another person. Cause I knew that would come from a, uh, you know, a family member, and we had experienced the death of my brother while I waited for a heart who suffered from mental illness. And there was an episode that ended his life. Um, and um, I was trying to understand how in the world can I accept organ donation? You know, this is my time. Yeah, I should just go. My brother laid hands on me and God through him. And he's a very good human being. I mean, he's so much like my father. He says to me in this prayer, he says, Paul, because of the sacrifice of a person willing to sign up to be an organ donor for whatever circumstance, you know, God's in control because of them, you'll be able to live a little longer, but because of the, greatest organ donor of all jesus christ who laid down his life kind of like a suicide on the cross you'll be able to live forever i'll be able to live forever we're all going to be able to live forever and you'll live and you'll continue to be able to resurrect yourself out of the darkness uh, because of him and that like changed my entire perspective and we're laying on this table you and i and they take our dead hearts out of us. Doctors, we've come up with the, the knowledge of how to take a dead heart out of a person and put the heart, a living heart, in us and raise us from the dead temporarily. So for me, and I know for you, Nothing is impossible for God. If God says, I was raised from the grave, uh, I was resurrected, and you've got all these guys and saw him. I, I, I joke that the women saw him first, you know, resurrected. And then the guy said, thank you, we'll take it from here. But, but it's so many saw him and witnessed his resurrection. And then here you are, Brian, who had this powerful experience um, as another witness to the world that God is real, that there is life after death, and that that love that we all want to feel, that pure good love comes from serving other people this way. By doing that, it leads us with a, with a, a direct link to Jesus Christ. Yeah. Thanks for sharing your amazing story. Read the from sudden death 
to paradise uh, by Brian. There is a link here um, on my website. Um, it's in the description and also I'll put a link to the YouTube where you tell this story in such a more detailed way. Because there's a lot of things I left out, we left out that uh, is fascinating. So any last uh, advice for for my listeners? Yeah, you know what, just, I guess, like what you had just said, I want to tail off that is that nothing is impossible for God. I mean, if he can take my heart and I put a picture of it in my book, but you know, I show it on my, my YouTube page too. You got to see it in color. It's, it's just fascinating to see that a heart that was so devastated that even the doctors couldn't believe how bad it was, but God could keep me going up until the point where he gave me that new heart that he promised. And, you know, to, to know that when we do die, we, our soul still lives and we're going to be with him if we choose to be. And I, I just think that's such a wonderful thing to know that this life isn't in vain. This isn't just a life of suffering and, and tediousness and, you know, having to go to work or whatever else we consider to be tough in our lives. This is, this is a beautiful life that we, we get to live and then go into something that's even better. That's and amazing. so it's, it's just, it is amazing. Love it. Hey, well, thank you so much, and we'll talk soon. All right. Thanks, Paul. All right. Talk to you later. Cause you took my scars, bruises, and broken heart, and numbed all the pain. Show me how to heal, and now I don't feel broken anymore. Number one, Billboard pianist Paul Cardall. Do you believe in miracles and second chances? Over a decade ago, I was raised from the dead. Read Paul's story, The Broken Miracle, by J.D. Netto. Visit thebrokenmiracle.com.